Welcome to Real Chemistry. Today we're going to be talking about phase changes and the enthalpy associated with those phase changes. What we're going to do first is talk about the phase changes, try to understand them a little better, and what this enthalpy thing means in the context of phase changes. And then in the second part of the video, we're going to do some calculations where we think about how much heat is released or absorbed when different quantities of water undergo different phase changes. That's a common calculation you have to do, say, if you're looking at heating or cooling curves for water. So this is an important calculation to be able to do in chemistry. All right, well, first, let's take a closer look at these phase changes, and then we'll get to those calculations. If you look at the picture below, you see all three phases of water represented. And so up in the clouds there, we have water vapor. That is water that's in the gas phase. And if you look at those molecules in this picture over here, each one of those red spheres represents an oxygen and the white spheres hydrogen, you can see that those water molecules are very far apart. And if we look at solid water, that is ice, as in the iceberg, you can see that some of those water molecules are actually basically overlapping. They're in very tight contact. On the other hand, liquid water is sort of in between those two. The water molecules are close together, but not as close as they are in ice. And what you should remember when you're thinking about these phase changes is that it takes energy to spread apart water molecules. Why is that? Well, there's something called hydrogen bonding, which causes an attractive force between the water molecules. And you can kind of think of it as the water molecules being covered in glue. If you want to pull them apart, it takes energy. You've got to rip apart that glue. On the other hand, and this is a little more counterintuitive, if you let those water molecules come together, that actually gives off energy. So remember, if you want to take water molecules farther apart, that takes energy. Let's look at an example of that. Boiling water. So we boil water all the time, and you put water on your stove, and you apply heat with the stove, and eventually you can spread out the water molecules. And that takes energy. It's an endothermic process. And because it's endothermic, if we go down and look at the enthalpy associated with it, we'll see that it's positive. So what that enthalpy is saying is it takes 40.7 kilojoules of heat to spread apart one mole of water molecules from being a liquid to a gas. And we call this an enthalpy of vaporization because we're vaporizing that water. So it takes energy to go from a liquid to a gas. But what if we do the process in reverse? What if we let that gas condense into a liquid? We see this condensation all the time. If you have a cold glass, water will condense on it. Moisture from the air condenses on it. So here you see water molecules on your glass that have come from the air. That's condensation. They went from gas to liquid. And over time, those actually warm up your glass because as they condense, as they go from a gas to liquid, the water molecules get closer together and they release that same energy you put into them if you are boiling them. And so what we notice about the enthalpy change is since this is now a process that gives off heat, an exothermic process, we have a negative sign by our enthalpy. And what that's telling us is for every single mole of water that goes from gas vapor to a liquid, it releases 40.7 kilojoules of water. So over time, your cup's getting warmer because of the phase change going on at the edge of the cup. Okay, now let's take a look at all the different phase changes we can do and think about the enthalpy changes associated with them, right? So we can either go solid, melt that to a liquid, boil that to a gas. And all of those steps are endothermic. That is, they take energy. So here we see the enthalpy of fusion which is the energy that is needed to melt ice. And it's 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So when we go from solid to liquid, it takes 6. Point, or it takes 6.02 kilojoules per mole of water that you're melting. Same with boiling. We already said that takes energy. But if you go the opposite direction, these numbers in red up here, right? If we condense water, it gives off 40.7 kilojoules per mole. If we freeze water from a liquid to a solid, that also gives off energy because you're letting those water molecules come closer together. So this process can be a little counterintuitive, but if we go from gas to liquid to solid, that's exothermic. If we go in the other direction, from solid to liquid to gas, that's endothermic. And that's really important to remember if we're calculating how much heat is absorbed or released when we undergo phase changes. So let's take a look at an example problem. What would it look like to calculate the heat associated with these phase changes? So this problem says what quantity of heat is needed to vaporize 3.2 moles of water. These problems in a lot of ways are basically just like stoichiometry and enthalpy problems, where you're thinking about how much energy is going to be given off or released when you run a reaction. 
And here the reaction we're running is we're vaporizing water. That is, we're taking it from a liquid to a gas. And I've broken the process of these problems down into four steps. And the first thing you want to decide is what enthalpy do I need to use? Do I need to use the enthalpy of vaporization or the enthalpy of fusion? Because that'll tell you which number you need to use in your calculation. So here, vaporize is going between a gas and a liquid. So if we're going between a gas and a liquid, then we're going to be using delta H of vaporization. So our delta H is equal to 40.7. Now we have to decide, is that positive or negative? So I'll leave a blank space there, and we'll decide, is this an endothermic or exothermic process? So that's step two. We have to decide if our enthalpy is positive or negative. And here's where it's so important to be able to think about the phase changes being endothermic or exothermic. Since we're vaporizing water, we're spreading water molecules apart. That takes energy. So this is an endothermic process. So we have a positive delta H. And the units here are kilojoules per mole. Okay, so straight from the units, you can tell that if it takes, or if it takes 40.7 kilojoules for every mole, all we got to do is multiply 40.7 kilojoules per mole times the moles and we'll get out the heat. A lot of times people will write this as, a re, as an equation as Q is equal to the moles times the delta H. So Q is heat, delta H is our enthalpy, and N is our moles. And that's fine if you want to think about that way, but you can really just think about the units. If it's going to take 40.7 kilojoules to go ahead and vaporize a mole of water, then all we got to do is multiply that by 3.2 to get out the heat. So it's fine if you want to think about it as the equation, or if you want to think about it just by thinking through these sorts of problems. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the moles. We're vaporizing 3.2 moles. And our enthalpy change is 40.7. So this is step four. Step three said calculate moles if needed, where you already have moles. So I'll show you a problem in a second where you don't have moles and it adds one more step. All right, so 3.2 times 40.7 is going to give us off 130 kilojoules. We lose the moles because we multiply by moles and the moles are canceled out. And that tells us that if we want to vaporize 3.2 moles of water, it requires 132 kilojoules of energy. Or I'm sorry, 130. All right, now we'll look at a problem where we have to think a little bit about going between grams and moles. So it adds one more step but not too much more difficulty. What quantity of heat is absorbed when 12 grams of water melts? So now let's decide, are we gonna use the enthalpy of fusion or the enthalpy of vaporization? Well, the water is melting. That means it's going between solid and liquid. And so that means we're gonna to wanna to use the enthalpy of fusion. So that means our delta H is positive or negative, we don't know yet, 6.02 kilojoules per mole. Now we need to think about, is it positive or negative? That's step two. So is this an endothermic or exothermic process? Well, the water's melting. That means the water molecules are getting farther apart and that takes energy. So this once again is an endothermic process, it has a positive sign. So whenever the water molecules are getting farther apart, the sign should be positive. Whenever the water molecules are getting closer together, it should be negative. And now all we have to do once again is multiply moles by delta H to get out that heat. But here's where we come into a little bit of a problem. We don't have moles yet. We were given grams. So before we can plug it into this equation, we have to solve for moles. And so our moles are 12 grams divided by the molar mass of water. So we want to go from grams to moles. So we get one mole up there. And our molar mass for water turns out to be 18.02 grams. And when we do that, we'll get out 0.67 moles. So that's how many moles we have. And that's, that's the step that that adds if we're giving grams instead of moles. But that's not too hard. We've been doing that since the beginning of chemistry, presumably. So 0.67, that's our moles, times our enthalpy, which is positive 6.02. So we multiply that together, and we'll get out that our heat is 4.0 kilojoules. So what that tells us is if you want to melt 12 grams of water, it takes 4.07 kilojoules of energy. All right, let's go ahead and do one more problem, where here we want to know the quantity of heat released when 27.2 grams of water freezes. Again, step one, which enthalpy do we need to use? Well, this is freezing water that is going between solid and liquid, so we're going to be using the enthalpy of fusion. 
Then we have to decide if it's positive or negative. Remember, if our water molecules are getting closer together, it's negative, it's exothermic. If our water molecules are getting farther apart, it's endothermic. So we wanna use the enthalpy of fusion, which we know is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. And since this water is freezing, that means those water molecules are getting closer together and that means that's an exothermic process. It has a negative sign. Water molecules getting closer together, your enthalpy should be negative. All right, and now we have to multiply it by moles, but if you look, we have 27.2 grams. Again, we have to go grams to moles. So 27.02 grams of water times one mole over 18.02, just like last time. That's gonna give us our moles of water, which turns out to be 1.51. And now all we have to do is go ahead and multiply our moles in our enthalpy. And so this time we're gonna get moles as 1.51 times a negative 6.02. And when we multiply those together, we're gonna get negative 9.09 .09 kilojoules. And that's our Q. So what this is telling us, because that sign is negative, is that it's giving off energy. So if we freeze that water, those water molecules are drawing closer together and that's gonna give off energy and it's gonna give off 9.09 .09 kilojoules of heat when we freeze 27.2 grams of water. This seems confusing because water is cold. But remember, we're just thinking about the phase change and not any changes in temperature that we had to do to get that water cold enough. So you're thinking about water at zero degrees Celsius, the water molecules start far apart and they drift together and that gives off energy. So this is an exothermic process when we freeze water. And it's going to give off 9.09 .09 kilojoules of heat to the surroundings. Thanks for watching Real Chemistry. If you have any questions about these problems, please ask them below. You can also subscribe to receive updates about future Real Chemistry episodes.